Hey, welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today I'm taking yet another detailed look at a previous generation GPU. A few weeks ago I checked out how the Fury X is getting on in today's games, and then followed that video up with a look at the GTX 980 Ti. Since a lot of you seem to enjoy that series, I have decided to revisit the GTX 970, which I will then end up comparing in part 2 to the R9 390. The GTX 970 is of particular interest for a few reasons. It's the only GPU that I can think of that was met with so much controversy and drama upon release, and yet despite that became one of the biggest hits ever. Out of the gate it was met with rave reviews for its unbeatable value. On launch day in my own review I gave it a stellar score of 95 out of 100, claiming it brings top notch value and performance, and noted that there's even more to see if you plan on overclocking. I was less impressed with the GTX 980, suggesting that it was a tad too expensive, but did note that overall it was still a very impressive GPU. Right, so none of that sounds controversial or drama infused at all. That came shortly after the glowing reviews when it was discovered that roughly 13% of the 4GB VRAM buffer was partitioned off, limiting that memory to a much narrower memory bus. The card was advertised to have the same 256 bit wide memory bus as the GTX 980, resulting in a bandwidth of 224GB per second. However, due to the core configuration this wasn't possible, and rather than risk harming the card's marketing potential with a 3.5GB memory buffer, Nvidia awkwardly tacked on another 512MB using a narrower 32 bit wide bus. So while the card did technically have a 4GB VRAM buffer, it wasn't capable of the performance claimed. Rather, the GPU was limited to a memory throughput of 196GB per second when working from the primary partition, and just 28GB per second from the smaller half gigabyte partition. The controversy prompted a class action suit against Nvidia as well as board partner Gigabyte. Nvidia's CEO issued an apology to gamers on the company's blog in an attempt to appease gamers, but in the end ultimately had to offer a refund to those who previously bought a GTX 970. This however didn't change the fact that at the time, the performance seen in those glowing reviews was the exact same performance gamers were receiving. The worry though was that gaming titles would inevitably become more bandwidth hungry, and that the GTX 970 would eventually fall into a heap. That's a legitimate concern, at least to a certain extent. Many gamers though do grossly seem to overestimate the importance of the VRAM buffer, and think that having more memory somehow always equals more performance overlooking the fact that the GPU itself might not have enough power to actually crunch that much data efficiently. We saw this with the R9 390, which went from the R9 290's 4GB buffer to a much larger 8GB buffer with no real upgrades to the GPU itself. Last time we looked into this by matching both GPUs clock for clock, under playable conditions they both delivered the exact same performance. It might be interesting to look at this again now that we have newer and more demanding games. Anyway, back to the GTX 970. Despite the controversy, and the negative backlash and all that angry pitchfork stuff, this GPU actually strengthened Nvidia's position, despite the odds it went on to be one of their best selling GPUs of all time. Roughly two and a half years later, the GTX 970 is still by far the most popular GPU used by those that game on the massively popular Steam platform, according to their hardware and software survey. Last month, almost 6% of all gamers that use the service did so with a GTX 970 in their rig. Just 3% of gamers now run with a GTX 1060, and disappointingly less than 1% use the highly underrated RX 480. With so many GTX 970 graphics cards having been sold, it's not surprising to find a huge number of them on the second-hand market. It's possible to easily snap one up for under $200 US. In fact, I have seen some selling for as little as $150 US, and that's had quite a few of my viewers asking me should they consider snapping one up. The alternatives at that price range is either the 3 GB GTX 1060, the RX 470, or the RX 480 4GB model. So I've taken my old Gamewood GTX 970 Phantom graphics card, benchmarked it in the out of the box configuration, and then again with a custom overclock. In the past I have to say the GTX 970 has looked very weak when tested using the Nvidia reference clock speeds. Admittedly though, this can be a bit misleading as Nvidia were very conservative when it came to clocking their Maxwell based GPUs. Gamewood, for example, shipped their GTX 970 with a 10% factory overclock, and that has a rather significant impact on performance, as you might expect. Not only that, though, but I was able to boost the clock by a further 10%, taking the core to 1265MHz, which resulted in a boost frequency of just over 1.4GHz. 
What I want to know is though, can the GTX 970 still cut the mustard? And is it worth purchasing if you can get it for somewhere around the GTX 1050 Ti or RX 470 money? So let's go find out. Rise of the Tomb Raider is a very memory intensive video game and here at 1080p the GTX 970 does very well, matching the 3GB GTX 1060 out of the box. Through overclocking it does find a further 12% performance, hitting an average of 104 FPS and consequently overtakes the 6GB GTX 1060, which happens to be none other than a factory overclocked for the Win Plus model. Now at 1440p the GTX 970 does start to struggle, though the out of the box configuration still manages to keep pace with the RX 470 and matches the minimum frame rate of the 3GB GTX 1060 and 4GB RX 480. Overclocked, it is able to sneak ahead of the 8GB RX 480, but does fall short of the EVGA 6GB 1060. Keep in mind this is an NVIDIA sponsored title, so I'm certainly not expecting the GTX 970 to look this good in relation to the RX 480 and all of the games tested. Far Cry Primal was tested with the HD texture pack installed and enabled. Out of the box it matched the RX 470, though its true potential was realised only once overclocked. Here we see a 20% boost in performance reaching an average of 65 FPS to match the EVGA GTX 1060 6GB card. Overclocking doesn't help the GTX 970 out at 1440p which is interesting. That said it's not a complete disaster as performance is still on par with the GTX 1060 3GB and RX 488GB graphics cards. Although Nvidia's Maxwell Hero looked quite impressive in Rise of the Tomb Raider and Fire Cry Primal, the same can't be said for The Division when using the DirectX 12 API. The performance isn't horrible, but here the 970 can only match the 470 once overclocked. The performance margins are similar at 1440p, and here the RX 488GB and GTX 1066GB are out of reach of the previous generation value champ. Despite sparing it some embarrassment by using DX11, the GTX 970 still doesn't make out particularly well in Hitman, though to be fair it was at least as fast as a 3GB GTX 1060 at 1080p. Similar margins are seen at 1440p, and again out of the box the game with GTX 970 Phantom matched the GTX 1060 3GB. Now these results are very interesting indeed, and dare I say is this evidence of Nvidia neglecting to optimise their previous generation GPUs? Even when overclocked, the GTX 970 is well down on the 3GB GTX 1060, not something we've seen previously. The same is true at 1440p, and here the GTX 970 is 14% slower than the 3GB GTX 1060. Still, it was able to roughly match the 4GB RX 480. The GTX 970 does get back on track for the Overwatch test, and out of the box it's able to roughly match the 3GB GTX 1060, making it faster than the RX 488GB graphics card. Overclocked, it was also able to catch up to the 6GB GTX 1060. Bumping the resolution up to 1440p, we find similar results, and again the GTX 970 looks very impressive in this title. Brace yourself, the Doom results are unexpected. <laughs> Oddly, the GTX 970 is faster than the 6GB GTX 1060 once overclocked. Here it roughly matched the RX 470 with a very unexpected 167 FPS. That's an 11% boost over the factory overclock, which did see the Gamewood Phantom graphics card trail the 6GB GTX 1060. Even at 1440p, the margins remain much the same. In fact, here the GTX 970 is able to slightly pull away from the RX 470 once overclocked. Again, we find some rather unexpected results, this time when testing with Total War Warhammer. Here the GTX 970 matched the 3GB GTX 1060 out of the box and wasn't a great deal slower than the 6GB model, so nothing unusual there. However, once overclocked, performance was boosted by 11% as we reached 79 FPS, making the Gamewood's graphics card faster than the 4GB RX 480 and only slightly slower than the 8GB model. Bumping up the resolution didn't change too much, again we saw a 10% boost from our custom overclock. Mirror's Edge Catalyst throws up performance that's probably more in line with what we would expect to find. Here the GTX 970 is on par with the RX 470 and therefore not a great deal slower than the 4GB RX 480. Meanwhile through overclocking it is able to keep up with the 8GB RX 480 and 6GB GTX 1060 graphics cards. Moving to 1440p we find similar margins, though here the GTX 970 isn't quite as strong, but the reduction in performance when compared to its nearest competitors is almost unnoticeable.
Out of the box, the cut down Maxwell GPU is roughly able to match the 6 GB GTX 1060, and more impressively, once overclocked, it finds itself sitting between the RX 480 GPUs. Moving to 1440p, the GTX 970 with its factory overclocked falls slightly further behind the 6 GB GTX 1060, but again, it is able to match the 8 GB RX 480 once overclocked. Much like what was seen when we tested the Division using DirectX 12, it seems Maxwell's inferior low-level API performance is once again a problem, this time in Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Out of the box, the game with GTX 970 was slower than the RX 470, though overclocked it was able to match the 6 GB GTX 1060. We find similar results at 1440p, though it is very interesting to note that unlike the 3 GB GTX 1060, the GTX 970 didn't fall away here. Battlefield 1 puts forth quite the challenge for the GTX 970, though matching the RX 470 out of the box was still very impressive. Overclocked we reach RX 484GB levels of performance, but we're still quite a way off the GTX 1060 6GB. The 1440p margins are much the same, and with an average of 63fps once overclocked, it really is hard to deny that the GTX hasn't gone the distance for those who purchased it over two years ago. The GTX 970 even does reasonably well in Mafia 3, at least in relation to GPUs such as the RX 470 and RX 480. It does require overclocking to match the RX 480 8GB graphics card, and this meant that it's still quite a bit slower than the GTX 1060 6GB. Now at 1440p we see an 11% performance boost from our overclock, though this only netted us an extra 3 FPS on average. Having seen weaker than expected performance in The Division and Deus Ex Mankind Divided when using DirectX 12, the Gears of War performance is surprisingly strong. Out of the box, the GTX 970 delivered a strong minimum frame rate, and once overclocked matched the GTX 1060 6GB and RX 480 8GB. The GTX 970 did fall away slightly at 1440p, nothing extreme, but it was certainly certainly more impressive at 1080p. The Maxwell GPU doesn't look particularly impressive out of the box when testing with Titanfall 2, at least when compared to the RX 470 for example. That said, it does still manage to maintain over 60 FPS with the very high quality settings in effect. Overclocking boosted performance by a massive 14% margin, and I suspect the memory overclock was particularly useful here. Overclocked, the game word card was able to match the GTX 1066 GB. Moving to 1440p, the GTX 970 now looks much better with the factory overclock when compared to the GTX 1063 GB. Once we apply the manual overclock, it is again able to match the GTX 1066 GB. Once again, we see strong performance gains from the GTX 970 once overclocked, and here it was able to match the RX 470, RX 480, and GTX 1063 GB graphics cards in Civilization VI. Now at 1440p, it is able to match the GTX 1063GB and RX 470 once overclocked. The Call of Duty Infinite Warfare performance is fairly typical of what we've been seeing. Out of the box, the game with GTX 970 matches the RX 470, and once overclocked, it's able to catch up to the GTX 1066GB. The GTX 970 is slightly weaker at 1440p, and although still very playable, it does fall further behind the RX 470 in its out-of-the-box configuration. The Watch Dogs 2 performance is very similar to what we just saw when testing with Infinite Warfare. At 1080p, the GTX 970 is faster than the RX 470, but slower than the RX 480 4GB. Then once overclocked, it roughly matches the GTX 1066GB. Once again, cranking the resolution up to 1440p does slow the GTX 970 down slightly, but of course the results are hardly disastrous. I have updated my benchmark results to include Resident Evil 7 Biohazard, and as many of you know, this game is a massive VRAM pig. This can already be seen at 1080p. Here, the 3 GB GTX 1060 does suffer quite a lot, and so too does the GTX 970 in relation to the RX 470. That said, overclocking the core and memory really does help out the Maxwell GPU, and now it's able to match the RX 470. Of course, this is hardly something 970 owners would brag about, but it does help save face. Much the same is seen at 1440p, though out of the box the GTX 970 appears very weak. Again, though overclocking is able to regain quite a bit of ground. Alright, so we're almost at the finish line. Last up we have For Honor. Here the GTX 970 wasn't a great deal slower than the 4GB RX 480 out of the box. Overclocked, it was able to close in on the GTX 1066GB and RX 488GB graphics cards. This time at 1440p, the GTX 970 remained very strong with the margins going almost unchanged. When it comes to power consumption, Maxwell was very efficient for its time, and even today it's still very impressive. The factory overclocked Gamewood model only consumes slightly more power than MSI's RX 480 Gaming X8G model. 
Meanwhile, our overclock only increased system consumption by 9%, which is very good. Of course, that is almost a 50% jump in total system power consumption when compared to the EVGA GTX 1060 6GB card, and for the most part, the 970 was slower. Right, so now that we've looked at how the GTX 970 performs in 20 modern games, let's tally up the results and take a look at the averages. As we often found, the game with GTX 970 Phantom delivered similar performance to the RX 470 out of the box. Once overclocked, we saw a performance boost of 12% on average, and this allowed the GTX 970 to match the RX 480 4GB while falling slightly short of the GTX 1060 6GB. Those GPUs were of course only factory overclocked and do have a bit more headroom left when custom overclocking them further. Take the RX 470 for example, although not overclocked here, in the past we have been able to extract somewhere between 10 and 15% more performance out of this graphics card. This then would place the RX 470 on par with the overclocked GTX 970 result that you see here. That being the case, you can safely say that the GTX 970 now performs similar to that of the RX 470, a graphics card that sells for around 170 US or 270 Aussie today. Therefore, secondhand shoppers will really want to be paying no more than $150 US or say $250 Aussie for a secondhand GTX 970 graphics card. Even at that price though, you have to wonder if you're not just better off buying new and investing in a GPU that's proven to deliver better DirectX 12 performance. One thing I will say, for those of you who purchased a GTX 970 back in 2014 or even 2015 for the $330 US MSRP, you have certainly gotten your money's worth. If you do indeed agree that it's on par with the RX 470, then the card has only depreciated by $75 a year or 47% of its initial retail value. That's pretty good, and the fact that it's still such a capable 1080p gamer, and really for the most part can handle 1440p without much trouble, it means that we'll continue to deliver for some time yet. Anyway, in summary, is the GTX 970 worth buying? Well, obviously it comes down to the price, and based on all the testing we've just done and the results we've found, I believe that price to be no more than 150 US, or 250 Aussie. So if you can get one for that price or less, then yes, it is worth buying. So if you guys enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. Really, really appreciate that. Support's great. And I am still working on the R9 390 benchmark results and I hope to have them up soon. It takes a huge amount of time to do all this testing, testing the card in its out of the box form and overclocked. But I will definitely get that done because I'm very keen to see how the 390 compares to the 970 in the games you've just seen tested. Anyway, that's all for this one. I'm your host, Steve. I hope to catch you again very soon. Thank you.